I'm Emmanuel Chop. I'm a research associate at the uh, Department of Vertebrate Bird Paleontology at the museum. And I'm mostly studying sauropod dinosaurs. These are the long necked ones, uh, the big ones, uh, of which we have a lot of them from the Western United States in the um, so called Moore's information. And first, uh, we will go out actually to the Moore's information and show you a video of an excavation that we have there, which is going on since 2016. The video itself is from 2018. While you're watching, uh, feel free to post questions and comments uh, in the comments on the YouTube video, and we'll, I'll answer a few of those after uh, this video ends. So when people like go out to say they want to look for dinosaurs, they're real, always ask us, where do you want to dig? So this year we're excavating in the south end of the Bighorn Basin in the Morrison Formation looking at dinosaurs. The Morrison Formation is one of the most iconic formations within paleontology because it, it's the place where the first great dinosaur discoveries were made in North America. It has Brontosaurus, it has Stegosaurus, it has the dinosaur species that everybody on the planet has heard of. This expedition is the 2018 installment of the American Museum Nearcos project. So this is a joint project that's run between the American Museum and the University of Lisbon and my colleague Octavio Mateus. We have to imagine 150 million years ago this as a, a big plain with some vegetation, a few forests, very large rivers and the entire ecosystem preserve and it gives a good glimpse, a good photograph of the life during the late Jurassic. One of the goals of having this expedition is also have, having a training ground for our students in paleontology. We run the Master in Paleontology in Portugal and we invite the students to come here today. Well, let's keep this one um, protected with, with, with a film. The basic way that we extract fossils from, from the, the, the ground is just like the, you know, Barnum Brown did when he was tearing around here and stuff in the 1890s. We are still using the same techniques that Barnum Brown and others have done. So we still use the hammer and chisel and, and brushes. It's always a destructive process. A typical day in the field, it's all weather dependent, but it's, you know, you get up, go out there, and you just like sit there and pound rocks all day. <laughs> so, uh, we can't use dynamite anymore, which I wish we could. <laughs> hey, Octavio. I think this might be a bone, like a, a surface, this rounded thing yeah, here. Yeah, it looks like that. So if it is, this could be a, like a like like theropod a metatarsal. <laughs> if you make an assessment to excavate then, you just start digging. And you start pretty far away, and you go closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and to, uh, you know, until it feels safe. Then you uh, do the jacketing process, which is just like covering it with toilet paper and burlap infused with plaster of Paris. And then uh, let that drive, crack it on the bottom, have that dangerous moment of flipping it over when you hope that the whole thing isn't going to fall off the top of it, which has happened, and uh, then uh, plaster the bottom of it. The Morrison Formation isn't just dinosaurs. I mean, there's a tremendous number of other fossils which have been found there. Of when the early dinosaurs came out during the big dinosaur rush of the late 19th century, they dismissed a lot of the smaller animals because they were looking for big animals to fill their dinosaur halls. And that's one of the reasons that we started this excavation and is to try to, to fill in the picture by looking at the stuff that was ignored by all the early collections. It gives us one of the best pictures of the origin of a lot of the major animal groups, be they frogs, be they uh, lungfish, be they... Like a turtle, perhaps, a pterosaur. So all those animals which are more obscure, harder to find, hard to preserve, and that will tell us a lot about, about the environment around here. Well, this year we have two sites that are about five kilometers apart, but they're, they're, they're quite different in some senses. In one place it's the uh, material that we excavated in is very sandy and soft. The other place is more what we call indurated, meaning that it's harder and we have to use more jackhammers and that kind of thing. We're still early in this whole project here because we've been at it for three years now, but uh, we're just going to excavate and excavate and excavate. 
because there are so many bones. Um, we're talking about many skeletons in the same position, in the same layer. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun, but scientifically, it's much harder. If we have one single skeleton, you know exactly every bone belongs to that animal. If you have many skeletons together, is that femur, for instance, from animal to the, to the right or the animal to the left? We don't know. There's a vertebrae here. Well, I mean, if this is the only thing in the way, mm -hmm. maybe I can go that way eventually. Collecting one bone can just take a lot of time. So you have to have large crews and you have to be able to come back to the places year after year and year after year. Every time since the first day, every time we see this site, one gets overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with, with the landscape, with, um, with the geology of the region, but also with the amount and the quality and diversity of bones we find in, in the site. In the first week we got here, we found four skulls. And that's normally, that's more than one has in their entire life. You need this, like, this section. The thing about being a paleontologist is, is uh, that you never know what you're gonna find when you go out to the desert. All right, here we go again. Thanks so much for all these interesting questions. I probably won't have time to answer all of them, but let's just start with Kenneth's question. He asked, why does the rock break apart, but not the fossil? Well, we wish the fossil wouldn't break apart also. Um, sometimes we have, uh, we can avoid this a little bit by, working around the fossil once we see it. But before we actually see a fossil, uh, very often how we detect it, how we actually discover it is by breaking the rock and the fossil. This, um, it's just how it works. We can't really work around that a lot, but uh, we have a lot of actually glue out there and adhesives that are uh, specific for, um, for fossil excavation sometimes. And these, uh, with these, we can basically glue them back together once we saw, oh, there's a fossil, we have to uh, be a bit more careful. So the closer we go, we come also to the actual layer where we have fossils in, um, or where we know that are the, the bones, the more, the finer are the tools that we use to um, get around the bones uh, and, and try to, damage them as, less, as, as little as possible. All right. Um, several people asked about how dinosaurs died. Well, um, it depends a little bit. In the site where we are now, uh, dinosaurs, or where we excavate, dinosaurs did not die because of a meteorite. As, uh, the, there was an asteroid, actually, another uh, meteorite, but an asteroid coming down uh, in the end of the Cretaceous, which is like 80 million years after these dinosaur sites that we are excavating out there in Wyoming. Um, we are not really sure exactly why those dinosaurs died that we are excavating, but um, what we know is that we excavate in um, rocks that were a riverbed 150 million years ago. What we also know is that um, some of these uh, dinosaur skeletons have likely been a little bit transported by the river and then deposited because we find that a huge mix of stuff, not just uh, dinosaurs, but actually also a lot of plants and uh, small bones of reptiles, of small reptiles. Which brings me to another question from Rakesh. How are dinosaurs related to modern day reptiles? Well, um, modern day reptiles are kind of the cousins of dinosaurs. They 
closest relatives of dinosaurs are today are birds. Birds derive from dinosaurs, from uh, meat-eating dinosaurs. So they are kind of the children of the dinosaurs. And actually, the uh, scientists say that dinosaurs are still alive and birds are dinosaurs. But modern-day reptiles are basically their cousins or something like that. All right. Um, several people also were asking how we preserve the bones. That's um, actually with the same uh, materials that you use to glue pieces back together. Um, this is a uh, kind of an adhesive that you can dissolve in acetone. And it depends on how much acetone you put. Uh, the more liquid it is, the more it serves as a, a conservant and the more um, uh, non-liquid it is, <laughs> the more it serves as a glue where you can piece uh, glue pieces back together. So we make it usually very liquid in the field um, where we just kind of try to put a protective layer of that on top of the bone. Um, which can then be removed again uh, once the bones are back in the museum and in the lab. Lena asks, how do we know where fossils will be? Well, that's a very good question also. Um, in that case, where we went, there was actually a, uh, a local fossil digger who pointed us to that site. Um, most of the times, you basically just look on so-called geological maps. Geological maps are like normal maps that, we, that uh, you use for roads, but instead of uh, like forests and stuff like this, you see um, where the different uh, layers of rocks are. And um, there you can identify the actual age and type of rock that you know could have fossils in there that you're interested in. And then you go, sometimes nowadays we go on uh, Google Maps and actually check if those rocks can be seen in certain areas. And based on those um, uh, Google Map uh, explorations, they kind of make up a tour uh, where we actually go there and just walk around and if you're with our eyes on the ground and see if we find um, pieces of bone that are already eroding out and that are on the surface. And then we can try to go into and ex start to excavate and try to follow the outlines of the bone. It's, it has been tried to uh, use like sonar or other uh, equipment to um, try to see underground, but um, that is very difficult and really depends on the area where you do it. In many cases, the rocks and the fossils themselves, they have very similar density, so uh, it's really difficult to um, understand with these technologies if there's some differences below ground or not. What else? FS asks, have you ever not found all the pieces? And if so, what do you do then? Well, these are all fossils. And especially the bigger the fossils are, the um, less likely it is that we find complete fossils. You might find com a complete bone or uh, a few complete bones, but it's very, very rare, especially of sauropod dinosaurs, that we actually find a complete skeleton. And even if you would find a complete skeleton, there is still a lot of stuff missing because we miss all the muscles and all that. So there is always um, 
one of the big tasks in uh, actually paleontological research is trying to piece together information from all these uh, incomplete findings and based on all this together reconstruct um, not just the skeleton but actually how um, those animals lived and where they lived and with what other animals they lived. So it's all kind of a detective work where you have to combine various lines of evidence to actually finally get to a um, complete picture of what you're studying. All right. Um, let's go into one of the spaces in the museum where we actually uh, put these bones that we excavate in the end. So after excavation and preparation uh, for of these bones, uh, they go in, into this collection space, which we call the big bone room. And that obviously already says it all. This is where we store the big bones. In the basement of the museum and here to the right, you already see a familiar face probably. This is a T-Rex skull. This is not an original actually, it's a cast. And it's actually also not in the big bone room right now, but <laughs> it was when the tour was filmed. This big bone room is uh, where I spend a lot of time when I am at the museum doing research because most of the sauropod bones that I'm studying are big, so they are down here. Um, in those, uh, the shelves that you are seeing right now uh, are actually some of the first bones that have ever been excavated from the Morris information. They're from the 1870s. And they were excavated by a team that was working for the famous paleontologist Cope. Cole is asking how we transfer the bones from the site back to the museum. That's a uh, actually, not that easy indeed. Um, we might see a little bit of how we do that still in that big bone room um, because some of the bones have actually never been unpacked. Um, so what we do after uh, like trying to conserve the bones as much as possible from um, in the field, we uh, pack them into plaster jackets. So we use plaster of Paris, we dip that into, so we, we dip um, burlap strips into that uh, plaster and then wrap those burlap uh, plaster strips around the, the blocks with bones that we want to take out. And that plaster becomes really, really hard in the end and is a perfect protection for the transport back to the museum. Here you can see some of these some of smaller plaster jackets that those white uh, things in the middle of the picture right now. These were plaster jackets from a, an excavation in the Triassic. What are sauropods? Well, uh, these are the long-necked dinosaurs, the big herbivores that ate plants and many of them, uh, or, or some of the most famous of them are from the Morris information uh, where they excavated um, or where you saw the, the, the film excavating. And almost all of these bones that you see in this video, um, these are the plaster jackets again and behind these plaster jackets are two vertebrae from the neck of uh, one of these Morris information sauropods. That's actually from an animal very, very similar to Brontosaurus. Here we're going towards the back. What you see here are uh, vertebrae from the tail of some of these long necked dinosaurs. They're all from Wyoming. These bones are very heavy much heavier than uh, real bones would be uh, because these are fossilized. That was a question from Lynn. Um, 
So during fossilization, some of the actual bone gets replaced by minerals and also some of the cavities that you see in the bones um, or that, that are present in, in actual bones of living animals, they get filled in with sediment and with rock. So because of that, the fossilized bone that we have here, they, they can become really, really um, heavy, especially the limb bones and, and uh, yeah, other big stuff from sauropods. Here you can actually see a funny thing as well. The, there are two skulls here, one in the front that we just saw before and one that we see now a little bit in the background in the dark. So the skull that we saw now, that was a skull that was put on um, the Apatosaur, which is on the fourth floor in the museum right now, the famous Apatosaur Mount uh, in the museum in New York. For a long time, um, researchers thought that the skull was something like that, but only in the 70s, actually, late 70s, I, um, John McIntosh, a specialist in, in sauropod research, found that the skull of Apatosaurus looked very, very differently. And then many museums started to take down um, these kind of bulky skulls and put on uh, the, the real skulls of, of those animals. Joanna asked what role does technology play on dig sites and at the museum? Well, on dig sites, it doesn't play that much of a role. Uh, I mean, it, it plays a role in um, documenting the site, but not in actually excavating, not that much. Um, because we have to be very careful and work by hand is still the most careful method that we have. Um, but for documentation uh, of how the bones are arranged in, in a site, which is uh, useful to reconstruct how these animals might have died there. For that, we use um, sometimes, uh, well, of course, a lot of photo, 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 photography, but um, sometimes we also use so-called total stations, which allow us to specifically identify in three dimensions where each bone is and how it is oriented relative to other bones. In the Museum for Research, we use a lot of technology. Um, here, for example, we see a skull of an ankylosaur, it's one of these armored dinosaurs. It kind of looks like a tank. Uh, and some researchers study the brain um, shape of these animals. Um, and, but to do that, we obviously have to be able to peek into the skull. And to peek into the skull, we use CT scanning, um, just as we use in hospitals. And if somebody has a broken bone, um, we put those uh, uh, skulls, into a CT machine and can then reconstruct virtually the cavity where the brain was in that skull. All right, here we are back at the beginning. Um, again, with these bones from the 1870s. There's some more questions. Ram, 84 years old. Uh, thanks for joining. How do you date the fossils? Um, we date the fossils not directly, but we try to date the rocks around the fossils. There are some elements in the rocks that um, are radioactive, so they slightly change uh, their composition over the millions of years. And because we know from uh, physics and chemistry how fast uh, certain elements decay and change, we can then calculate um, 
based on what we find now, we can calculate how uh, long ago this specific type of rock um, was formed. And with that, we can actually date uh, those layers where we find the fossils in. Mostly, if you want to hear specifics uh, for the Morris information, the specific element that we use is uranium, which decays into uh, lead. Um, so that decay is uh, useful for dating 150 million years old uh, rocks. The bones, when they fossilize, uh, there's a question from Nicole. Uh, they sometimes change color, not all the time. So if you find or, or see a bone of an animal that is living now, it's pretty white. Almost all the bones from the Morris information are these like dark brown to black. Um, some other bones get like a reddish color or even bluish or violet I've seen sometimes. Um, it really depends on how they fossilize. So there are different um, ways and different pathways how a um, bone can fossilize. And depending on that, and depending on the minerals that play a role in that environment, um, these bones do or do not change their color once they are fossilized. In our case, it's actually very, you're lucky that those bones are so dark because usually the rocks they're in, they're not as dark. So um, it makes it much more easy to recognize the fossil in the ground. What we see here right now in the video is actually a foot of a sauropod dinosaur. You can see the claws, they're pretty big and they're kind of tilted to the side. So this is a right foot. Um, those claws were useful for the sauropods to um, stabilize the foot while walking, even uh, in, in like soft, on soft ground. And they might even have used those claws to dig up holes to lay their eggs in. But um, yeah, that will need a little bit more research uh, because obviously we have never seen that happen. But uh, there are some indications in the structure of the foot itself and also in the orientation of the eggs in some of the nests that were found in Spain by Spanish researchers that um, those sauropods actually dug out a hole, put the eggs inside, and then covered it again with um, plant material or, or sand. Christopher asks, what carnivores lived in the Morrison? Well, yeah, I'm kind of biased, so I'm always talking about sauropods. Carnivores in the Morrison formation, the most famous one is definitely Allosaurus. Uh, that's also the most common. You find it throughout the entire um, formation. Um, and in almost every single site, you at least find teeth of Allosaurus. Other carnivores, um, carnivore dinosaurs are Torbosaurus. Torbosaurus is probably the biggest, uh, but it's fairly rare. Another big and rare one is Saurophaganex, uh, but there are some researchers that, who say that this is just a very big allosaurus. There is um, Ceratosaurus, and there are some small ones like Ornithocelestes and uh, others. Krishna is asking, how do you know if different looking skeletons you're digging up belong to the same species or are different? Well, um, this actually goes into how we recognize different species and different species, what we understand as different species are skeletons that have different shapes. We cannot test uh, 
the DNA or if, if animals can um, actually reproduce and produce offspring, which is what biologists uh, do today to identify species. We cannot do this obviously in fossils because there is no uh, DNA preserved and we cannot um, uh, study their behavior. But what we can do is we, we can study the shapes and compare the shape of different bones in, in different skeletons. And then uh, if you see that there are like very clear differences in the shape of, the, of a skeleton from one to another, that's a very good indication that they are actually different species. CJ asks, why are there high concentrations of fossils in certain places like the Badlands or the Gobi? This does actually not always reflect the real um, concentration of fossils in a certain place, but it mostly reflects um, how easy it is to find them, especially in the Badlands and the Gobi. We can see at the Gobi Desert, we can see those rock layers right away and we can just walk around and see bones cropping out. If you go into areas that are like heavily vegetated, like the tropics or something like that, where you have forests, or if you go into areas like New York City, where you have buildings um, that cover the layers, that obviously makes it much more difficult to find fossils too. It also depends a little bit on the, um, the type of rock they're preserved in, but um, a lot of it is also just how easy we can actually identify fossils. Right, so here we go back again towards the, the beginning, the entry of the big bone room and take one more question. Um, let's see. How did you become a paleontologist? Well, um, I was just kind of hooked as a kid by uh, all these dinosaur things coming up in the early 90s. And since then I wanted to become a paleontologist. And uh, a lot of it also had to do, I think, with a new museum that was um, being opened in 1992 in Switzerland, where I grew up. And that museum actually was opened because the, uh, the founder of the museum, um, Kirby Sieber, had uh, found and excavated dinosaurs in Wyoming in a site that was excavated in the 1930s by the American Museum of Natural History. So it kind of, um, is a full circle for myself. Uh, the American Museum in the 30s went to Wyoming digging out dinosaurs. A Swiss um, paleontologist went back there in the 90s, made a museum. I got inspired to um, buy that museum to become a paleontologist. And then uh, I did my studies uh, at University of Zurich as a, uh, in biology and then paleontology, did a PhD and ended up working at that American Museum with actually that collection from the 30s from Wyoming. Yeah, with this, thank you very much for uh, joining again and asking all these very interesting questions. I hope you had as much fun as I had going through the big and big bone room. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And if you wanna keep seeing these live streams with other researchers of the museum, please subscribe to the channel uh, on YouTube. And also if you wanna keep following me and my own research, um, there is a Facebook group on uh, the museum, a link to the museum called Dino Detectives where you can register and you can follow uh, some of the things I'm doing with people, other people at the museum with that material from the 1930s.